Overwhelm, a game released in 2019 by Random9. You may also know for, uh, Cardinal Quest 2. What is this? Overwhelm is a horror twin stick shooter metroidvania. I found this game from Reddit around the game's launch, I think, and well, it turns out I was lucky because there's barely anything on the internet about this game. I mean, of course there's a couple videos, but barely anything even like 20k views except the trailer, and even then, in the grand scheme of things, that isn't a lot. Horror games are kinda a genre that breaks easily if you get spoiled, if you know the scares that are coming, you aren't gonna be scared by them, but no one has played this game, so if you feel so inclined, you can play through this quality, charming, little horror metroidvania completely unspoiled right now. It's like 10 bucks regularly, but on Steam it goes on sale a lot, you can either play it right now, wait until you finish this video, or not play it at all, it's your choice. Like, I know I talked about the Wonderful 101 as a game no one cared about, but this is a whole different beast altogether. What wonders could wait behind this very icon? You are a knight, sent in to destroy a hive. You must go and collect five gems and bring them back to the main area. Each gem is highlighted on your map, but the map itself is completely blank every time you start a run. It's a simple premise because it's a simple game, but it's very effective. The game mainly uses three colors, red, white, and black, but there are options to replace the red with yellow, green, and blue. These are fine, but I think the game works best with red because it looks like everything was made to be viewed with red, you know? You move really fast in this game, like the weight and gravity of stuff is just so quick. You can jump, shoot, double jump, and do a lunge punch. These controls are tight. Most survival horror games use clunky controls, and in those cases it works, but for Overwhelm, it's also a 2D platformer, so I appreciate the tighter controls. But while you feel in control of your character, everything else feels against you. This is a horror game after all, and a Metroidvania. This game may only use three colors, but don't think that this map isn't memorable. When you spawn in, you don't have any of the map unlocked. You only have the blinking light of the gems to go by, wander around, and try to survive. You have three lives, you get your lives back by collecting a gem, or returning back to the starting room with a gem. Three lives sounds decent, but you also die in one hit. Die on your last chance and you're back at the start. That's right, this is also an arcade game. But not like what you think of when you think of arcade games. I mean the modern equivalent of these games' designs if you want to be fancy about it. Games that are meant to be played over and over and over again until you figure out the right strategy. And the thing about these types of games that most people don't realize is that probably a lot of your favorite games fall under this. Pikmin is an arcade game, Dead Rising is an arcade game, Fire Emblem on Hardcore is an arcade game, Game. These games are very, very different from actual arcade games, but in many ways they still have a similar DNA. Sure, you can probably beat these games on your first attempt, no problem, but can you go all the way? What's the best strategy? Testing the game mechanics, just seeing how few depths you can get until perfection. Then you also have the hard games, or the challenges getting to the end in the first place. Mega Man, Castlevania, Old, Fire Emblem, and while you can play through these games with safe states now, and that's probably the better way to play them, playing through them the intended way legitimately can be incredible. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Fuck you. A lot of speedrunning games probably fall under this type of thing, and while I wouldn't call something like Katana Zero an arcade game, speedrunning kinda matches a lot of arcade qualities. Just replace high score with time. Now, the thing that separates Overwhelm from Pikmin is. You aren't gonna beat it on your first go. Overwhelm is a very hard game, but also a very short game. A full successful run for the average player probably wouldn't take more than like 20 minutes. It's probably comparable to an NES game the most, if you know what you're doing and beat the game in like half an hour. But you're probably gonna spend a lot more than a half an hour trying to figure out how everything works. One of the many ways horror games have found to put a sense of fear into players is the fear of lost progress. Old Resident Evil games are known for using ink ribbons as items that let the players save. Even in the newer remakes, there's an option for this. My friend Christian beat the entirety of Remake 2 without saving or opening up the item box. Why did he do this? I don't know, but he sure did. 
Probably the easiest genre to incorporate into this horror genre mishmash was the Metroidvania elements because again, like Resident Evil along with many other horror icons, they already had a bunch of Metroidvania elements. But Overwhelm does a particularly good job of its world design making things seem like a naturally created part of this world and not just a Metroidvania map for the player to hop around in. A lot of these areas you could easily imagine what it would be like to be in first person which is particularly impressive considering the limited art style. It's all tied together with this very nice ambience and sound effects system from creatures fading in and out depending on how far away they are from you. The best of this is shown off in the mines area, everything is dark, you only have your immediate surroundings visible. The only way to light the way forward is by firing a shot. The beauty of this map is only truly given its time to shine once you actually get to your main objective. The bosses. Once you get to the marker on your map, you must break open the cage of the gem and fight whatever boss is located on that part of the map. Each one is based off an animal and can be hair raising even if you've fought them countless times before. They have multiple phases and can teleport during blackout moments so the AI doesn't get stuck in the loop. These fights can be a pain in the ass, but once you kill them, you aren't even done with them. The environment powers up. This was the feature that Overwhelm shouted at you in all its marketing. When the game first launched on its store page, it said it was the world's first reverse Metroidvania, which as a tagline sounds gimmicky as fuck, but in game it's actually where a lot of the strategy comes from. Sure, you can get to the boss, but now you gotta go back through with whatever new creature or attack was added. A lot of these areas seem like they were directly made of backtracking in mind. These power-ups to the enemies give a lot of routing to the game. Can you handle fast flyers for the entire game, or are you fine if enemies have more surprise attack opportunities? Which one do you want to save for last so you can get a quick getaway from fully powered enemies? It really makes you think about what to do next. After you beat the main game, you unlock New Game Plus, which is actually a very misleading name. I was thinking that it would be the same as the regular game, except that the enemies are fully powered up from the start, but it's not that at all. The map is not only mirrored, but areas are randomly sealed off, and it forces you to go to one specific boss at random, and as you get more gems, the map opens up more. The mirrored map really messes with me, and the whole mode has a sense of claustrophobia. It's a really interesting addition. Not everything about Overwhelm is good though, and at times it can be very cheap. With the one-hit system and everything still happening even if they're off-screen, some devs can feel like you had absolutely no control over them. Not all of the enemy power-ups are equal though. The Kraken fight is probably the hardest and most tense fight in the game, so I guess to balance it out they gave it the least threatening power-up. Spawns these fish guys that swim straight towards you, and not only are they barely a threat, but they only show up in very select pools of water, which take up around 1 20th of the map if I'm being generous. Once you get out of the water, the Kraken has no difference on the rest of your run. When you die, the game makes it known how many lives you have left by covering up parts of the screen with whatever this is supposed to be. It doesn't make getting your lives back much more relieving. But it can also just be really annoying. And when you get down to your last life, not only do you have to deal with... But your ammo counter is completely covered. I guess the idea was that the game is trying to tell you don't worry about your ammo, just focus on surviving, but like, I, I kinda need to know my ammo. It does show up again if you're low enough on ammo, but it's still needlessly dumb. Also, when the game launched on Switch, it had two-player co-op, but you could only use single Joy-Con for whatever reason. You're trying to play a twin-stick shooter with only one stick. Thankfully, they did patch in all controller options and co-op sometime after that, but it's still baffling that was forced at all at some point. I did play co-op with some buddies of mine, and we had a ton of fun, and it even got some spooks out of us. Definitely worth checking out with someone at least once. I could talk about the final sections and what happens after you get all five gems, but I don't want to spoil everything. So to recap, this is a horror game with reflex fast twin stick shooter combat that complements the metroidvania level design with tons of little areas that enemies can hide in, with a progression system that complements the arcade style replayability that complements the horror of having real stakes for failure. This is like five subgenres crammed into one it somehow feels completely natural. How did no one talk about this game? Maybe it was just like a marketing or something that no one talked about this game? Like, it's truly overlooked. It was overshadowed by the mess of shovelware that's always filling the Switch eShop and Steam. I guess you could say it was overwhelmed. Even if you aren't up for the challenge, you can change the difficulty drastically with assist mode, turn on infinite lives, infinite shots, even change how fast the game speed is. It's like really in depth. There's even a speedrun timer. Huh. I think I got an idea.
the random scorpion that spawned fuck oh. <laughs> There we go, world record for assist mode, where there's no other attempts, and any one of more than 7 brain cells could beat it. But hey, if you want to prove I'm bad at video games, then try to beat it yourself. But in all seriousness, some of these speedrun tricks are insane, these guys deserve credit. I'm not sure if they patched out some exploits, but even then, this game is just begging for a speedrun community. See ya! Yo, the pizza here. Oh, nigga! Ah! Oh, my ears burn.